and Lydia and Sarah. He was the first, the first widower that they became, became a, uh, that his wife died. And they all left children, it seems like. Now, Tio Jose, Tia Concha was Tio Jose's wife, and she died at childbirth and left one baby that was raised, I don't know by whom. Uh, now, Tio Carlos, Tia Margarita died at evidently at childbirth because she left a child too. And the Enriqueta, I don't think that the Enriqueta died of childbirth. Anyway, those children were, were raised by other children, and by other people that had taken them because their mothers had died. And Tio Jose, so, so Tio Jose spent a lot of time with Tia Maria because he was a widower and his children lived with Tia Maria. So in those days, uh, they, they patrolled the waters. So if, if there was any danger of a ship sinking or something like that, they were called salvavidas. So they would get lifesavers, would you say? Uh, they went on boats to, to go and meet those, uh, uh, those ships that, in that were in trouble. Mm -hmm. And he would come home with sacks of gold coins gold coins like that and throw them at Tia Maria like that. Look, look where I picked up like that. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean anything. So I don't know what became of all that money. Tia Maria just put in a sack and put in a closet. <laughs> so I don't know what became of it. Uh, and when, when Tia Maria would put you all to bed, all that little group of you and your cousin, that's why. And the, when she would give you all a, oh, when it was time for bed, when it was time to go to bed, Tia Maria would send us all up. Of course, Albert. first Philip, then Albert, and then the rest of us here. And she had a bottle that they brought from some ranch of honey. So she would take a large spoon, one spoon to this boy, one spoon to that one, to that one. <laughs> Everybody about washing the spoon. <laughs> Nobody ever caught anything. So we got a spoonful of honey every night before we went to bed. Then in the morning, the same thing would take place, but this was different. Another glass bottle like that with this much sulfur down here and, and here was full of water and sulfur that had been in the sun for two weeks before we were able to have a spoonful of that. So every morning we had a spoonful of that water and, and that had been in the sulfur. So evidently that was preventive medicine, I imagine, I don't know. Was, was the honey a treat or a medicine <laughs> at night? Was the honey a treat, a special treat, or was it medicine for you? It was medicine for us. Medicine? Uh-uh. What about the aljibe? Is that what you're talking about that had the sulfur? Well, they had a, a kind of a well beside the house. And, uh, and when it rained, the water would fall in there. And that was the only drinking water that I know of that we ever drank. And every morning you would have that rain water? Uh-huh. What? My father used to tell the story that before us, my father and them had been in that house too. So one time, Theophemia, one of the daughters, one of the sisters said, Alejandro, we ran out of water, honey. We want you to go down. It was dark. And he was scared. <laughs> but uh, we want you to go down to the well. And, and get a bucket of, of water. It was rainwater. And he said, well, I'm not going to. It's too dark to get up there. Well, we'll give you a drink of water, 
of holy water so that you'll be brave enough and go down and, <laughs> and fill the bucket with water and come up because we all need a drink and there's no water. So he said, well, let me drink the holy water. So they filled the little glass with the holy water for my father. He drinks it. I don't have to go anymore. I feel all right. <laughs> he, didn't go, he didn't go get the water. <laughs> and those are the things that I remember. Any other questions? She is saving advice. Is that like the Tavo that they saved? The how? Makes sense. The house that she has to save, where it's 20 years, the beds are made. Oh, yeah. That's, the that's our ranch house. Oh, they're gone. No, they, no. All right, I'll just come. Yes, no, the ranches were, it was to her, uh, you know, no, she I, fell. I not spending the same house. Oh, yeah. So now we're not going to spend that house. <laughs> yeah. No, you're just saving the house because we don't want to sell it. It's our roots. The villa property. The beds are made. The dishes are in their cabinets. The silverware is in its box. And I go there and I wish I, I tell everybody, well, my body may be in Edinburgh, but my soul is right here. Mm -hmm. If I had someone to live with me, I would live there. We're taking offers. <laughs> <laughs> there must be around 12 uh, champion uh, burials here in Port Isabel. Yes. And does she remember anything that happened or what? That remember last there? summer when we brought you for your birthday to eat lunch at the island and we went to the cemetery? Yes. And I have some nice pictures of Mother along there. Do you, do you remember, recall those champions that are buried there? Well, that's a new cemetery. The old cemetery was right by the, by the old church. Now, one time, I don't know if you know Joe Alamea, the judge in Edinburgh from Edinburgh. He married Maria Teresa Chapa. And so Maria Teresa was my sister-in-law's daughter. So one time she said, Tia Corte, I want you to tell me why are the two champions original have a grave in the old cemetery, not the one they have now. Uh, their names are there and the Alamias are not. Why is it that the champion survived, the grave survived, and the Alameas did not. Uh, uh, the ranch of the Alameas was called La Palangana. That's, and so they died here, and they were buried here. And I said, look, don't make the mistake. When you see that the champions have a grave marker, and the Alameas don't, it's, it's not the original one. In 1936, Tia Petra, my aunt, said, I am going to have a new marker made for my father and my mother. And in 1936, Tia Petra had those blocks made for her father and her mother. So that's how come the champions had a marker and the, and the Alamias did not. Because storms would come and just everything would disappear. What's a palangana? What is a palangana? I think it's something that, that, that holds on. Because they used to make quesos and put them in a, in a palangana. They call it a, a, a quesos like that. Oh, to age the cheese? Like a vat, maybe? Uh-huh. Asadera. Asadera, they call it. Where did she get her education? Where she was a teacher? That's a long story, yeah. Great story. <laughs> Tell them about your education. She had to quit school when she was... Um, I had no education. Since my stepmother was having babies right and left, <laughs> they withdrew me from school. Okay. When I was in the sixth grade, they took me out of school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go to school anymore. But you were a teacher. Then, she, yes. But, well, let me tell you. <laughs> then, then uh, the old houses 
had one room that was called the parlor. I don't know if you remember, if you're old enough to remember that, the parlor. So on Saturday, my stepmother would say, it's time for you to take the broom and the mop and go and sweep the parlor because going to be Sunday tomorrow, we might have company. So I love to have that done because my father had a huge diction. This was a real leather cover dictionary, this thick and this big. And it's still in existence somewhere. I wonder where. So my stepmother had that dictionary in in those days they didn't have a coffee table like they have now they had a little square table in the middle of you're not old enough to remember all of that uh, in the middle of the parlor so my father's stationery was right under there what did i do i spent the whole time finding out about words i knew more words than anybody that i that i know of hard words that people didn't know about because I had that extension to go and my stepmother would think that I, why are you taking so long in sweeping the parlor? I'm doing it. And I was doing it with my foot like that and I was reading the dictionary. By the time I got through, I had learned about 25 new words. So then when my daughters were going to high school, I had only a grade education and, and they say, Mother, what is the meaning of this word? And I would tell them, because I knew from my father's dictionary. But getting back to when you were about 19 and you taught at Stephen F. Austin School, how did you go about getting your teaching certificate? Well, since, since I was a great reader, reading had no problem for me. Now, but there are two subjects that, that are not self-taught, according to me. One of them is math, the other one is music cannot be self-taught. Anything that you can read, you can you can learn like I did. Uh -huh. Oh, I was a great reader. And the English classics are my love. So I knew all of that, but I knew nothing about math and I knew nothing about uh, music. So that's, that was, I would have graduated with honors well, let's get back to when you were 19. How did you get that teaching certificate? Because why? Oh, oh, when I was 19, my father was a great politician, and he asked for, for rewards. The one reward that he asked, I want my daughter to be a teacher. And when he came and told me, I, I'm going to get your school to be a teacher, I said, I can't be a teacher. Well, you're going to take a test. You're going to the courthouse, and you're going to take a test. So then they, they brought, from the State Department of Education, they brought this test for me. They, I ran through the whole thing that was written because then, but when it came to, they didn't teach music in those days. But math, when it came to math, I was lost because I, did, I only knew what two and two were. <laughs> but, but then my father, being a politician, got uh, to the rigmarole, they got Jesus Cardenas. <laughs> the names are being mentioned to, to work, To work the problems. <laughs> so the problems came and I put them with it and sent them to the Department of Fish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got wonderful grades. <laughs> and a teaching certificate for six years. Oh, oh, man. Man. Then she got married and started having a family. Then I got married, and in the new time, we had two girls that we loved dearly. When they got to be 11, we sent them to uh, in corner work in Brownsville, not because the schools in Edinburgh were fine, but we wanted them to find religion. So we sent them when they got to be 11 years old. So the two girls, Norma Linda, and Imelda were sent to, to Via Maria. So at that time I said, oh boy, I, I, I can start going back to school and going to college and getting my degree and then I can go back to teaching. Because this hunger for knowledge was within me. I just had to 
learned. I, even to this day, I call it a day lost when at 95 I have to learn something new today before I go to bed.